What's what the things? longest you've ever gone without jerking off? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Maybe a week. Dude, this was brutal, but I went 67 days once. I met my wife after that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Discography, the podcast that gives Gen X music maniacs a chance to smell like teen spirit again by connecting with a brotherhood obsessed with rating the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever mattered. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and with three new episodes each week, you're going to gain a comprehensive knowledge of an act's history and output in the time it takes to listen to one album. And in this episode, we'll be turning our spray cans on... No Ages Randy Randall in an hour-long interview that sprang unplanned out of the Jesus Lizard episodes we aired a little while back. In the next hour, we'll learn about that time No Age almost broke up, the most awkward celebrity interactions both of us have ever experienced, the joys and pitfalls of sobriety, and the ways in which their early band wives differed from the incredible two-man juggernaut That is the indomitable no age. Okay, first things first, you need to know just how seriously I take this craziness. Discography is heavily researched, and the music is always reassessed with fresh ears. We don't just cover albums. Uh Uh-uh. We do a searingly honest deep dive analysis of all EPs, singles, comp tracks, relevant solo work, and sometimes bootlegs and live stuff. Every release is slapped with an objectively accurate star rating between 0 and 5, which allows us all the real reason we do this the tootsie pop reward at the center of the rock and roll lolly to come face to face with the true shape of an artist's overall arc coming up we've got an endlessly interesting nine-hour multi-parter interview with the great david paho plus jennifer harima and interviews with lorraine and anthony fantano So don't miss out. Open up your listening app right now and click follow. And get ready to meet your new friends. They're all kicking it right now in our Facebook group, Discography Soldiers of Sound. That's the best way to find out what's coming up on the show, but there's a hell of a lot more. You get recaps of the day in music history, great artist and track recommendations, polls that put you in the driver's seat on guest and show topic decisions, access to a thriving creative hub if you're looking for your next collaborator, and much more. So make sure you don't miss out. You can find the link to the Discography Soldiers of Sound Facebook page right there in the show notes. And away we go then, with Randy Randall, as we duck and weave like two battle-scarred veterans of the interview scene, and I can say with great certainty that a nicer guy playing more brutal music I've literally not yet come across in my time on this planet. You record, you, uh, you're the producer. Check, check. Exactly. Yeah, I got a little setup here at the house, and we, we were downtown for years. <laughs> At the height of or the height of the pandemic, our friends who owned the building we were at for so long, it was like our practice space, studio, kind of cl- club headquarters. Um, yeah. They they uh, were going to sell the building, so we had to move out in okay. 2020. And so, uh, yeah, moved it all moved it all to the house, and it's actually been really fun and productive, and kind of have a new clubhouse where there's no rats and there's no stabbings or prostitution. <laughs> So it's a very you know agreeable I can, kind of. I can sense that on the new record, there's a distinct uh, <laughs> lack of any kind of rat stabbing vibe. Which is- yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think yeah. it comes through. There's a lot of uh, you know, coffee, homemade coffee, and nice clean mm-hmm. bathrooms with, with nice smelling things. Yeah, so I mean, you know, that kind of goes towards saying, yeah, I've had, I've had guests where it was like I, the main thrust is really just trying to eliminate background noise. It sounds like this will not be one of those sessions. Yes, yeah, it's a very quiet room. Here. I have it. It's fairly treated. It's a little cool recording studio. Sweet. In, in stark contrast to Steve Albini's typical working methods, yep. turn the mic on and whatever the fuck we get is what we get. It's out of- <laughs> <laughs> nothing's treated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it definitely works on these on these uh, records. How many? It's funny. He's like the mysterious uh, producer, right? On these Jeez Lizard records. Yeah, he. I think he sees himself as an engineer, and, and it, it. I still. I think it's odd. I keep waiting for him to cave at some point, and as his mortality looms closer and closer, for him to actually take credit for some of the stuff that's happened. But he never wants to do that, which is admirable, and kind of amazing. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's definitely, it's respectable. You know what I mean? I think he, he, I think it's good. You know, yeah, he, he is nothing but, um, but uh, conviction. If not, you know, I mean, on top of the, you know, the talent and skill, but I think, you know, he's made up more of, of convictions and sort of yeah. pros- proselytizing, you know, uh, unerringly un- so. I mean, most people right? by, by this point will, bu- like, for example, I, when I think of anyone, like the, the notion of the one act in music history that had the most high flying oh. ideals that then swung so ridiculously in the other direction, it has to be Jefferson airplane versus starship. <laughs> so like anyone who's usually vociferous in their beliefs caves the hardest. Right. Right. No, I think, I think he's figured out a way to do it. You know what I mean? He's got, he's yeah. got the work work ethic and he's got the nerd ability to just, you know, I think ratchet up his like kind of technical side, yeah, which I yeah. think, you know, it seems like he could, it's so it's like his interests, his bases are covered. Uh, my only thought, you know, is that, you, you know, he, he has a, a, a kind of cottage industry, right. With electric audio of, you know, just he'll turn the mics on for anybody, you right. know, and it's, and right. it's not expensive. So it's not like he's gouging anybody. He right. has enough of a name where he can, he'll just capture you for what you are. So again, respectable, but I imagine there's got to be, you know, a good third, if not half of the people that go there want to sound like Jesus lizard or Nirvana or the pixies. They want yeah. that sound. And I don't, I, it sounds like he's not interested in offering that service. I think the possibly the, the most impressive one was rid of me. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, he's, he's, there's there's so i think that's what that's the thing i guess the 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 t we're trying to cross right is that you know he so clearly has a sound or had a sound and had a creative thumbprint on so many records however the denial of that thumbprint or the um, staunch position to to not do that over and over again you know i guess is respectable but you have to mad you know i mean it's it just it, it's it's a new position i think in the music world i don't know anything people. about his domestic situation but i can only Nor do i yeah. if he was married that his wife every day would be like why the fuck did i marry a jackass who doesn't want to cash in <laughs> so I think, obviously yeah. <laughs> i don't think he's hurting for money though i mean i think the the right. quality of the work and the, and the quantity of work that he can put through you know electric audio i'm sure more than makes you know covers the nut and you know you know makes money i'm sure he's yeah, been yeah. profitable for many many years without having to cave in so it's very respectable you know i think it's again oh, you know yeah. i think you always to be mentioned you know in a similar sort of vein as like ian mckay but that's the thing though right so so very high conceptually minded people but they figured out uh, you know the the most moral to their terms version of capitalism right. you know what i mean i'm putting out documenting dc local dc bands like that's right. that's that's the arc of the capitalist again i'm going to sell those records and his splits at 50 50 and it's a very fair deal but it's you know and i think and in, in, in same with albini you know i mean figured out like hey this is my service i offer it at this rate this is what i do and it's fair and and still profitable they you know being able to, to run that kind of razor's edge in an right. entertainment industry quote unquote and right. do it I, I mean i'm very i yeah i'm i'm obviously a huge fan of both men and their work so i have no i have no uh shots to take at, at either one you know i'm a huge fan but it, but i think it is interesting it's a it's a yeah. and it's because i only because too i think as a as an artist you know that there's there's I think at least artists of my generation or, you know, maybe your generation, there was always that kind of pressure of like, well, you got to do it the way these guys did it. You know what I mean? There's, there's, it's such a, such, it feels like such a, uh, a, a, a road, a path that was carved. And yeah. so you're constant, at least for myself, you know, and I imagine other people in similar situations, you know, it's like, okay, can we play more than $5? Can you know, can we do more than a $5 show? Can we, you know, can, how do we record this? How do we do this? And, you know, it's just, there's, there's, there are large specters in this kind of um, whatever alternative indie rock sort of world. Yeah, in the interestingly, uh, the, uh, or maybe not interestingly, I don't know, but the, the only time I've ever actually seen you, <laughs> Not true. I saw you guys open at the Hollywood Bowl in 2010. You opened for oh, yeah. uh, Sonic Youth and Pavement. Yeah. Okay, that was a fucking great show. And I also saw you guys in a much different setting at Cinefamily. Oh yeah. What were we doing? What were we doing there? What was that? You were doing the soundtrack. Yes, exactly. Okay. You yeah, were doing yeah, the no. prompto thing. I can't remember the uh, what you were doing it uh, against. The film was called The Bear. Right, it's a right. Jean Jacques Carnot film from the eighties, where where they like it's kind of semi documentary, semi narrative. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, that was a fun, weird, cool experience. 
Yeah, yeah. I actually right around. Th- th- I'm gonna guess that was maybe 2013. No, but maybe a little earlier, 2010 or 11 at the latest. Okay. Yeah, uh, right around. Uh, yeah, around that time, that was basically my second home before it it became yeah. apparent that everyone was being raped there by a bunch of film nerds. <laughs> Ugh, <laughs> disgusting. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. When did you meet Dean? Oh, so I met Dean in '99 uh, when I first moved out to uh, Hollywood. We both kind of moved to small um, little uh, weird apartments, you know, not not but a few blocks from each other over in the in the Fairfax district in Hollywood. Right. And uh, we were introduced by a mutual friend and said, you guys should play music together because I was playing drums or I, I was playing bass in a band with this drummer and he knew Dean from going to shows. Dean was a very kind of popular person on the scene. He would sell zines out in front of shows. So he was the kind of guys, you know, just hanging out and looked cool. When you guys put together Wives, was that your first band with him? Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the ostensibly how, how he and I met was the, you know, he came over to the little weird little apartment and I flipped the map. My, I was just, you know, had a mattress on the floor. I flipped that up to cover the window and we, and we, and we practiced. We had our first kind of jam practice. The drummer that we both knew, our mutual friend set up and played drums. And then Dean and I, I played bass and I think Dean sang and played guitar. I think we kind of, you know, it's all mixed up. So do you see a direct corollary to what you're, what you wound up doing and are currently doing in no age, or was it totally different and much more of a, an aggregation of your brother's influences? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's grown over the years. So, uh, so yeah, so 94, I got my first four track cassette tape player thing or, you know, recorder. And so I would make, um, uh, just kind of bedroom cassettes for, for most of the nineties from 94 to 99. And then I moved out and I still kept messing around. I had a little sampler and stuff. And so I kind of did, you know, I was influenced by, you know, all these bands we talked about alternative bands, but also, you know, stuff coming out on grand Royal, the BC boys label, I think was an influence at the time that was very hip and cool. And I thought that was and stereo lab fits into there. John Spencer Blues oh, yeah. Explosion, Matador kind of stuff, Cat Power, you know, these were all sort of things that were entering my brain. And Dean came from a from a kind of hardcore background. Like I'd never heard Minor Threat or The Misfits till I met Dean. Mm-hmm. And I just wasn't interested in that because I think, you know, growing up in Southern California in the 90s, those in my mind, there had been a, a type of co-opting of the kind of the skinhead hardcore punk culture. It became that, that was crossed over into like a mall hot topic sort of vibe and they were like the football players at my high school had misfits t-shirts right, you know right. and so stuff like that I was just like oh that's that's boring or the ramones t-shirts i was already kind of commodified and so yeah. i was looking for stuff that was a little bit more you know darker or scarier i thought you know the idea of punk being you know confrontational or button pushing you know was sort of what i thought about punk and not this if it, you know because i got you know whatever i'm assuming we're not t- too far different in age but you know when when green day is the top hit you hear on blasting out of k-rock every morning yeah. like how the fuck is that punk but you know what i mean but like by, that, by the point by the time i was a teenager it was you know green day was the number one band and so the rebellion yeah. how is that punk you know my rebellious stance was to you know to find stuff on touch and go and you know go to a blonde redhead concert or trans am or something you know there was yeah. a kind of there's an active kind of i think i saw i saw blonde redhead at maxwell's in hoboken new jersey in i'd have to say 93 94 oh my god wow that whole world was was highly fascinating to me so anyway jesus lizard comes on to my sort of radar with uh lash and then from there i think i remember um you know we had one of those like secret santa things you do in like yeah, eighth yeah. grade and yeah. i asked uh, i put down on my list i wanted um anything by the jesus lizard and like this girl who i think had you know had never heard anything other than the grease soundtrack had to go to <laughs> sam goodies and look for something called the jesus lizard and <laughs> she and she bought me the the head um pure um kind of combo cd that yeah, had yeah. come out had been re-released and i thought that was awesome and she was but she was disgusted by me that I would like such a music. I mean, the idea of Jesus Lizard uh, being combined into the same idea as Se- not only Secret Santa, but Sam Goody. Right. Is, uh, those are some contrarian notions. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a beat. Oh, yeah. I, I grew up out in the Inland Empire in a small town called Walnut, which is next to Pomona and mm-hmm. Diamond Bar out there. And uh, and so I did not have, you know, I, I, had the, I had the leg up of having older brothers who knew cool music, but I was going to the mall to buy music. You know, I, I requested, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, me too. Yeah. you know, 
yeah, uh, white zombie make them die slowly from off Caroline. I remember going into Sam Goody and they had a big like phone book full of, of releases that you could order. If they didn't carry it in stock, I asked them for this white zombie record before their major label one. I was like, Ooh, they had a record before. I want to hear that. And so I remember going in there, finding it, writing it down, giving it to the guy, never getting it. But you know, it was one of those things of like trying, you know, there, there, there was no internet at that moment, you know, not to be too grandpa about the stuff, but you know, you had to find stuff. You had to look on it. And I also had a KSPC, which was the local college radio station out of the Claremont colleges, which I could barely get on my little clock radio. But I love that. I mean, I discovered bands like neutral milk hotel and Olivia tremor um, control, the elephant six stuff. You know, for me, uh, neutral milk hotel was not as impactful as, as, uh, as Olivia tremor control that does mm. get castle just a once in a lifetime piece of work. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think I was, I was, you know, of, you know, like we said, we've, you know, 10 years younger, I think I was able to plug in neutral milk hotel with my sort of, um, hormonal, you know, late teens, early twenties, sort of, uh, fatuations with relationships. And so I think those, that record airplane over the sea and my, my, uh, lusting of, of you know, teenage and early twenties sort of got married together, you know, as those yeah, yeah. records do. Used to, used to lust after Anne Frank, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a perfect, if you're attracted sexually to Anne Frank, that's a perfect record for you. There you go. It really yeah. is. You know, I, it struck me as funny, the more I thought about it after, you know, it, admittedly you did give me a list of things to choose from, mm -hmm. but I thought it was funny that not just that you picked this one, but that the list was uh was an aggressive list because i guess if you were like a a, a, a slick venal t sort of marketing guy mm. you would want to choose something with more of an ambient tilt in it because people oh, right, helping right. people definitely kind of guns in that direction than the than the buzzsaw and and gravel raucous tendencies of the of the jesus lizard were, was there a part of you that was wanting to maybe do some brian eno or no <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily. I think I, you know, I come to ambient sort of stuff and, you know, these sort of sonic experiment things staunchly and ignorantly and negligently um, through my own sort of fascination with creating them. Mm -hmm. My, my tastes in terms of what I listen to, I think in that world probably go more prog rock or new agey, you know, kraut rocky in uh -huh. terms of, but, but honestly, you know, the, my ambient um, record collection is, is very thin. So I think I'm still, I, I approach the genre as a creator with a type of naivete that may or may not serve me well, but I, I, I enjoy it that way. Kind of, I create yeah. it, but I don't really listen to it on its own a, a lot. When I was in high school, a good friend of mine, Rick, he used to do something called the compact disc roundup. He would go through everything that I owned and figure out what <clears throat> my favorite album was. In the winter, it was always Husker Du. In the summer, it was always Joni Mitchell. Uh, <laughs> You know, I would use aggressive music almost as a as a shield against the temperature changes. Do you find that you were kind of schizo in your tastes as well, or did you I, lean more toward the hard? I guess so. No, no. I mean, I think I liked you know the, this the kind of the the pummeling sort of music of Jesus Lizard for a cathartic type of release. You know, mm -hmm. I think and this I think also speaks to a lot of you know, like I said, these early teen years where I first discovered them and sort of plugged into that sort of feeling of just bouncing off the walls and you know uh it, it met up nicely there and then and then i you know had this sort of love for our, you know bob dylan so you know that style of sort of stripped down mountain goats were um where john darnell lived in uh claremont at, at, at that time i remember seeing him at a small coffee shop and it's totally disarming in a way where you just right. one man with one voice and a guitar you know can can just reduce you to rubble you know, and like what powerful, you know, um, what a powerful experience that is to have. And so I think there was, you know, I think I was looking for the same thing from both types of music, from this very stripped down kind of music, as well as this fully caffeinated, high, high energy octane kind of experience. I just wanted to be sort of, um, you know, just, just leveled. <laughs> I was looking for yeah. the music that would, that would take apart my brain and leave me a smoldering mess after. And I think that could happen, you know, kind of in a tactile sort of physical way of being in a mosh yeah. pit, you know, and then also in ways that were sort of intellectual and more emotional, where this, this guy just said something so honest and so, and so, um, disarming and or you know or so just like it just it, it like cut through ev all like all the bullshit you know i think you know i put a band you know someone like uh, bonnie prince billy or smog mm -hmm. on a similar kind of wave of yeah. just like wow that's like that he's just saying the darkest parts of my heart and my soul in a song 
From somebody who really is a neophyte, embarrassingly, I'd, ha I'd have to say, the closest comparison that I can make that felt apt to me is that the hold steady kind of mm. feels like a less participatory, more observant version of the Jesus Lizard. I don't even know if they were influenced by the Jesus Lizard, but they seem like or Craig Finn seems like a similarly storytelling kind of a guy without the balls to participate in these crazy tales. But yeah, the, I mean, really the Jesus Lizard, I can't think of a better inheritor of the Stooges crown uh, mm. in, during the 90s than, right. than these guys. Oh, that's kind of so, interesting. Yeah. It's funny. I was talking to, so I just saw the, um, the, the filmmaker Lance Bangs, uh, yeah. had, has had this birthday party here in, in LA a couple of week, a couple of weeks ago. And, um, he, he's done this before where he just asked musicians and sort of odd collaborators to sort of come together and play at CineFamily at our uh, aforementioned, uh, favorite, uh, venue yeah. uh, before it became terrible. So it's taken over now by this new brand, um, brain dead. And, uh, they're kind of like a streetwear sort of thing, but they have, a, they own the movie theater now where they use rent it and huh. they do stuff so um so we had played there with uh with, so it was me and dean playing with mike watt and bradford cox from deer hunter um, oh, wow. this was this was probably you know i don't know nine years ago seven years ago and um and and lance had kind of given us a list of songs he'd want us to play and it was kind of fun and novel and you know before kids we had nothing else to do so why not do it and um and so that was fun. And then he did something similar. So I think he, did, he didn't do it for a few years. And he also screens, he has a lot of great um, unseen clips of stuff. He's been documenting, you know, music for, for uh, decades. So yeah. he has a lot of stuff that's never seen the light of day. So he gets to show it on the screen and then the band comes out and plays. But one thing I saw, so there was um, Britt Walford and David Pajo from Slint. It was mm -hmm. another band I, I, I hugely loved. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> they were playing and then uh, on guitar and drums and then Watt, uh, Mike Watt was playing bass and then they, they launch into um, here comes Dudley. And then, and, and I'm like, Oh, that's what that riff is. Dun, 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 dun. And I'm like, okay. What? Um, what? And then, and then Yao comes out from the side and he starts singing it. Huh. And I was like, Holy shit. And I like ran to the front of the, you know, the front seat of this movie theater and just was like singing along every word. I was so <laughs> excited to see, to see him play this. So this was very recently, but um, I forget why I got off on this tangent, but it was, I knew we were doing this also. I think this was yeah, around yeah. the time. So I was like, wow, what a, what a rare, cool, weird, but it really felt like all of my CDs kind of melted in my car in <laughs> 1990 right, right. in 1996. <laughs> I was like, wait, I've, so I've slint, you know, fire hose and Jesus lizard all on stage at the same time that's and, awesome i know yeah. uh that lance did that slint movie which was uh, the breadcrumb trail which mm -hmm. is uh, so grateful to and to see those guys in that basement especially brit he yeah. looks like a little boy yeah and he's playing these incredibly complicated uh, math <laughs> rock progressions. Uh, and it, the disconnect is uh, tremendous seeing Huge. that. Did you watch The Prisoner? The 60s show from the England? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Was that, a big, was that a big thing for you? That was a major thing for me. That was, that was college time. Yeah, I worked in video stores and we'd have to find it on, on video. I remember um, mm -hmm. Vidiots had the full collection. We only had a couple of them at the video store I worked at. Who was number one? You are number six. That you was the whole thing, six. is that right. the answer to the whole show was right in the intro. I love that. Yeah. And then uh, many years later... Who sampled that? Doesn't someone sample that? Uh, Iron Maiden. Though the number yeah. of the beast. Right? The number yeah. of the beast. Yeah. But then, do you think that Carpus has a feel like that? Like a Kind of, yeah, right? It's kind of got that secret agent, you know, kind of like spy music. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean, like, yeah, like this could be the soundtrack to somebody sneaking around, and you know, they did a music video. It's funny. I remember um, I would get those, you know, those VHS compilations of mm -hmm. like, now nah, this is alternative music, but it was on VHS, and I, I remember it had like PJ Harvey from Rid of Me, um, Fifty Foot Queenie, right? The video for that song, and then it had a song from Down. It had a Jesus Lizard video. It was so strange. It was I don't know why they made these things but i only had two of them and it was like a subscription kind of scam basically I had my mom call and say you can't charge my kid you know 24 dollars for did you, you know, did you do the columbia record club of oh course, yeah right oh, yeah of course yeah i was the prime target you know what i would fucking do is i did it for myself then i would do it i would send it to all my friends houses too so i could just <laughs> rip off like you know a hundred times at once yeah yeah but i know i mean i got like the soundtrack to uh last action hero you know, like some <laughs> shitty like ACDC soundtrack. That I, I didn't want it. It was like I, I got like the one thing you want, and then you'd get all these other stuff you didn't want. I actually had I had a job when I was uh, when I was eighteen, going uh, by personal appointment to people's houses, and this is 
after CDs had already been introduced. Mm -hmm. They were on the market, they were selling well, and my job was to go to people's houses and sell them a thousand cassette tapes within, oh. ten, within 10 years. What a nightmare. It it's was such a scam. Like a ridiculous, I mean, the worst job imaginable. There could be, you know, a Dave Matthews record out there or even a Guided <laughs> by Voices record or something that I just, you know what I mean? There's there's bands that lock in. You know, you have that sweet 10 to 16 year window. I would say that's maybe be too generous, but it's mostly all that stuff in there. Like, I, you know, I, I can't even judge. I have no ability to, uh, to, to say what it is. Is Dave Matthews an example of somebody that you would not normally connect with or that you would or? I wouldn't. Yeah, no, I'm somebody, right, right, somebody right. made me put, put this record in front of me and right. I go, oh, yeah, that sounds like whatever I, my opinion of it now is, but they could say, but I loved this record when I was this age. I'd be like, right. Okay. But yeah, I'm given that's that, you know, I could see that. We're at the mercy of the universe. So the first major traumatic event that happened to me was my, when my grandfather died, my, my mom's dad <clears throat> on the way to the hospital for me to say goodbye to him. Ugh. Phil Collins, a groovy kind of love came on the radio. Yep. And now in order for me to access that, um, that interior emotional life that I had when I was 16 years old, I got to put on that fucking song. <laughs> yeah. And there's, it's a trigger. It's a handle, right? It's a handle yeah, yeah. to a place. Yeah. <clears throat> right. hundred percent. I understand. You know, there's, I get a few others like that, like Sarah by Starship. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, it's yeah. unfortunately really evocative for me. No, there's you know? the timing of, of the biographical nature of music, I think is, is not to be understated. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, wh where music slots into your timeline of your own personal story is, yeah. is, you know, 200% of why we like music. I don't call it guilty pleasures anymore. If I like something, no, it says something about you and your life and your age and where you're at. And, you know, and, and uh, you know, like I said, I was being humble earlier about, about the work of, of my own band of no age, but I've had people come up to me and, and, and share stories about my music and times in their lives. And I can't, I can't share that experience with them, but I can appreciate you know, that their, their experience with that music. I, I have no part in that, you know, is the way I, my personal feeling because I didn't know them and they didn't know, you know, like I had no, I, I created it for my own reasons and I'll always have those. And then, and then the fact you put it out in the world, you hope that it goes out there, you know, not unlike children or you know, some degree you put this out there and you know, one day you just, you let your kids go and you go, I hope they find a good yeah. place. I hope they find a good partner. I hope they make their way in the world because it's out of my hands now, right. and it, you know, and it happens faster than you realize. And so these records, and these songs people make, you know, are like that. And, you know, I'm sure if I were, you know, to talk to David Yao and explain to him what Monkey Trick did for me at this time, and I think, you know, he, I would get the look of, of you know, of disdain or of un, 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 uh, unforgiving, you know, kind of like distance. Because he doesn't know that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not talking about him. Yeah. I'm basically, I'm talking about myself. Sure. So it'd be, it'd be just like going up to somebody and saying, you know, when I was seven, my cat died, you know, I can I can empathize, but I don't know what you're, the fuck you're talking about. Why are you telling me your cat died? Right. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with me. You know, I went to film school. I've been, you know, uh, several films to my name, plus this show. Always been uh, marching to the beat of the muse. Whatever the muse is showing me. Oh, only more recently have I been trying to examine why I'm as driven as I am and where it's coming from. And the it's reason your dad, you weren't close to your dad, you're still you're trying to impress yeah, him. Right, right. So you didn't, he didn't give you enough attention. And so now you have to show the world that you've made the world your father. Is, is, you is to, it all as mundanely reducible as that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not familiar with you at all. But no, I think speaking generally of, of, of men at a certain age, you know, I think we can all trace that back to some degree of, of, um, especially if you, when you say the word driven, like if you're questioning your, the drive and the ambition and what it is, if, you know, if, if an artist has something to prove, you have to trace it back down to those pathways that were drawn where we were not given. Cause I'm similar. I've, I'm of a similar type of ilk and I've, you know, I've, I've softened and my quest for dominance and, and for recognition and attention over the years, but not without doing a lot of work and a lot of self right. in inspection. Did but that think, work happen you know, between 2013 and 2018? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, even a little sooner than that, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, you, know, it's, you can, it's, you can it's, hear in their music, right? I mean, this happens to everybody. But you guys also, you probably didn't. It's not as, as easily reducible as you guys, you know, released an object and then went away for five years, but you guys seem to go away for a while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had it, it was not a it was not 
it was not necessarily a, a huge conscious choice. I think there was a moment there where we could have broken up. You know, I think Dean was very fed up with um, the experience of, of being in the band and being on the road and, and the sort of repetition. I think he was finding a lack of creativity and artistic expression and what we had become at that point. You know, mm-hmm. there was not a lot of room for um, uh, creativity. You know, I think we were, we were touring, touring, touring and write, write, have short time to write and then tour for a long time of touring. And that's not necessarily the life of an artist, you know, following the muse and, and doing stuff. We were kind of on a schedule, mm-hmm. sort of, to, so to speak. And, and there was money writing on it and things. There was a reason why we, were, we got to that point. And then the expectations of things as well, you know, fulfilling a record contract with a, with a you know, major label like Sub Pop. I think we felt a little, uh, he felt a little bit back in the corner. I was very much enjoying my, my, point in the band at that you know at that point i was i was newly sober and so i found a kind of new i was enjoying the life on the road and the life of the artist new again without you know any kind of substances in my body so i was having a, i've kind of i you figured my I, was it yeah. uh, was it uh, drugs alcohol or all of it yeah i'm in the program oh yeah me too a a and a or uh, uh, a mostly I, i'll cut this out if you want uh, no 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 it's all right i'm okay to talk about it it's been really really fucked up for me because i was uh, clean and sober for 13 and a half years then in five within five months in 2019 i had three major surgeries so out of nowhere and by the way i'm somebody i still call my sponsor every day out of nowhere i was on morphine norco gabapentin weed it was very difficult to navigate oh my god yeah did you were you able to kind of turn it around that was two years ago and i turned it around to an extent but i've not gotten to a point because of the pain with my back and i'm a type one diabetic i haven't figured out a way to let a couple of the things go in terms of being able to get through a day Wow. The waking up in in the middle of the night thing, a large part of it is the the blood sugars for my diabetes. You know, listening to Jesus Lizard at two in the morning every single day, every day, just different bands. Wow. This podcast is part of that sort of therapy or sort of just giving your brain something to chew on while it's processing. I I don't know if it's therapy or if it's driving me deeper into the Aldous Huxley of it all. Mm. This is very much a Lester Bangs style driven pursuit to try to it's not just like hey let's give star ratings to things it is i think an exploration of compulsivity and and dementedness <laughs> as much as well, anything else as as, as been put out as, as in the guise of entertainment exactly yeah it's ex- well, that's precisely what it is because you know i put out three shows a week dude that's that's absurd I, I, I have a, a show called The Private Press with Paul Major mm-hmm. that goes that goes up every Tuesday. That's only private press records. And then a wild card show every Thursday as well. The, well, it definitely feels like a swing towards like work, workaholism, it you is. know, in, in place of other things yeah, or we, in, 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 in entertainment too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We can't. Right. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's All keep right. going. Let's keep going. All right. we'll keep Sorry, going. brother. All no, right. no, no, no. I'm into it. I'm, yeah, I'm empathetic, but well, yeah. It's, All right, it's hard. So, it's hard to know where, 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 where yeah where do we go it's tough right yeah 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 go to go to a meeting right that's where we go yep exactly yeah <laughs> well i feel like i just got a dose of it though good um, good all right december 19th 1993 show was recorded it was then oh. released in 94. yes now we we only tend to touch on live albums briefly unless it it adds to the you know the story or it's new material performed in a live setting but i don't mind staying on this for a while if you want yeah well I'd, i'll just say you again like this was in live in live uh chronological time for young randy randall right. i was you know I, I got this as it came out and um was so blown away like as you know i was still kind of finding my place and you know really open to experiencing different music and um and trying to you know hear everything that was out there and this just stuck stuck with me and so hard Mm -hmm. um to the point where you know all the little like chatter in between all of david yow's you know sort of stuff he's talking about there's like sounds like there's a bird in the the (laughs) room and the uh, max monitor monitor goes out and witness (laughs) <laughs> you know there's just so many great moments and that and you know like i you know i need you like i need my mouth full of your cock you know there's <laughs> yeah. no, like calm, like calm down so you calm the fuck down you know I, I have to imagine that the audience was not reacting that they were a very unsympathetic audience or very bored audience and he was just taunting them with all of right. these things but it like you know they just they, i i uh I have these things playing on loops in my brain, especially when I, and now, you know, when I go tour or we're on stage and stuff, I have, 
you know, I have David Yao's little patter from this record stuck in my head. Do you feel like you were channeling this guy? I, I mean, it, like, you know, at first when you were a young man, when you were in Wives or if you were... You, oh, no, I think it was, you know, I think he, he was almost the, the, the super ego of it. You know what I mean? I think there was, it, was, it was aspirational. Right. And that sort of way of like, you know, like I couldn't really be inspired because I knew I couldn't achieve it. Right. But you, I would aspire to, you know, just to know that he lived, he walked the earth and had done and done and said and was embodied all these types of things. And which is probably a lot of my own making. You know, mm-hmm. I think I've met the man now and he's very much a man, <laughs> flesh and bone. But, uh, but you know, the, the legendary sort of Superman status in my head, I think served to drive me towards a goal, you know, or sort of what could be done, you know, what type of expression sort of catharsis could be captured in a live music setting. So I think there was always a question of like, how far do you go? Like, you know, you, you can't go as far as David Yao goes. Like, you know, right. keep pushing, keep pushing. You're never, it's right, never, right. it's never like, far enough. Yardstick. He's, yeah, totally. Yeah. I'm just, just, a, a, yeah, exactly. Just Were you a, nervous a, when you, t- I mean, do you get nervous as a, like a fanboy when you, t- when you meet these people? Yes. Yeah. Especially, you know, in younger year, I think as, as time goes on, you realize most people just want to be left alone. Right. So I do my best to just, to, you know, to be polite and speak about something that they would have an interest in speaking about, which is usually right. not themselves or mm-hmm. myself. <laughs> you know, they're, they're trying to find a topic of interest that the, they would want to sp- hang on for, for a few minutes. And, that, right. and that's, and that's not me. They don't want to talk about me for five minutes. They definitely want to talk about themselves for five minutes. So I've learned some strategies with how to interact with people just because I want to breathe the same air for a few minutes. And so whatever gets yeah. me to do that. My, my strategy yeah. has always been to reference something that nobody would reference that they have done, but that, you know, like, for example, mm. uh, okay, I met uh, Bono in The Edge. Oh, geez. And I, you know, referenced Elvis Presley in America, which is a very obscure song that's completely mangled by Brian Eno's producerial hand <laughs> off of Unforgettable Fire. And I told them it's you know never too late to release that as a single. That generally has served me well over the years. The icebreaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it shows that you know enough about them and you have a sense too of Too cool for school. Right, right. Cool. Yeah. I'll try to just go with the general sort of like how you doing? What's going on? What are you working on? Or how, you know, how are the, how's weather? Just try to keep, keep things light and see where that goes. If you get too nerdy on it, I've seen people just recoil. I met Kramer, Michael Richards once at a kid's party and he was pleasant, you know, and, and perfectly no- nice until I said like, Hey, I'm a fan or Hey, you know, uh, you know I'm, just to call it out of the air, you know? Down? Oh yeah. Yeah. He, 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 he turned tail so fast and I get it. I understand. But it was one of those things that was like, was he the biggest what, piece of shit you've met. No, not at all. Response. No, no. I just, I just think I, I get that you know he's he he occupies a level of fame and infamy. Probably doesn't want to have much to do with himself. Post racial slur, this guy would he would do anything to have that experience with you again and to be told that you're a fan. You think so? That became kind of known for what he who he was. Oh yeah, it's, hor- it's I'm sure it's horrifying. Yeah, but you yeah. know I don't. It was in the context of a, our kids. We had a mutual friend, and it was a you know just the, the weird sh- shuffle deck of of celebrity in Hollywood. Sometimes you end up with you know <laughs> and, and around certain people for unknown reasons. You're like oh okay, I guess this is why we're here. I'll tell you the biggest fucking piece of shit that i ever met and it was circumstantially in a venue where we were breathing the same air where i was at slam dance with my film zombie honeymoon and there's john goodman oh no i I just uh it ain't so no, John. Yeah, I'm saying it's so, yeah. He it wasn't even like he was an asshole. I approached him to tell him that I, you know, that I liked his work. Of course, yeah. He froze. He was walking. He stopped walking. It's like he left his body, didn't Aww. want to re inhabit his body until the moment had passed. So didn't respond, didn't flinch, didn't move. Only only when I turned around and walked away did he start walking again. Wow, I mean, that yeah, is scary. It was, it was fucking really weird. weird thing. I know he's one of us, you know. Uh, I wonder yeah. where his where he's at. Yeah, that's 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 a shame. I've seen him interviewed. He seems like he'd be really hard on himself. He punishes himself. He's into that kind of thing. I, I like no, to join I, in. Uh, yeah. Well, no, that it was that he was mad at himself, not me. <laughs> trepanation. You know what trepanation is? What is that? 
drilling a hole in your head to let the pressure out, to let the bad spirits out. Trepanation, yeah, it was a thing they did like in the 1800s, you know, kind of road okay. to wellness kind of thing. They give give your brain some more space by put, put drilling a hole in your head. Jesus. So wait, yeah. is that, uh, was that a recommendable thing? It, but yeah, science at the time thought there, there was some good to come of that. It also leeches and, you know. Yeah, leeches. Don't jer- yeah. Not, not jerking off. Yeah, you know, what's the things. longest you've ever gone without jerking off? Uh, That's a good question. I don't know. They were weak. Dude, this was brutal, but I went 67 days once. I met my wife after that. <laughs> <laughs> it fucking what, worked. What, what a romantic uh, love story. It, it actually it actually <laughs> was. I had to kind of clear the, the, the playing field, and I met her. It worked yeah. out. So what is your best record you've ever made? Hey, lads and ladies, Dave Gebro here. I abandoned my career and moved my family 3,000 miles to be able to focus exclusively on discography. And so if you're like me and enough is just never enough, then please visit patreon.com slash discography and become one of our Patreon soldiers of sound. Discography is an entirely listener supported show, and it's also intended to be a three times a week music deep dive experience. So do us both a favor and consider giving it a shot. Trust me, I'm working hard for the money, so hard for it, honey. There's the main show on Friday, a Monday wildcard episode, which is either a soul-bearing interview with that week's special guest, or an offshoot show like Queasy Listening and Rock Cousteau. And then on Wednesdays, there's the humdinger of them all, Discography's The Private Press with Paul Major. You got nothing to lose. If you don't dig it after a month, you're refunded no questions asked once again that's patreon.com slash discography what is your best record you've ever made oh my god i don't think it's possible to say and so like i said earlier similar to children right how are you gonna say what's well, this is my best ch- child i like i like writing songs and so i think there's a lot of song writing that goes on in everything in between I think there were some moments there. I also think snares like a haircut has a lot of good songwriting. And I'm talking songwriting from a kind of more mechanical craftsman like trade of, you know, understanding how, you know, that's how the melody of song, you know, this, this kind of, that's a little bit nerdier and doesn't always necessarily translate to the best songs ever. But I like, you know, a song, a song like send me, I'm really mm-hmm. proud of having written that type of a song as a, as a, as a band with only one guitar player where I'm in, or I'm in charge of creating a lot of everything that's not rhythm and words. I think that song really stands out as something that I could, I could rest my hat on. I think it works well. I get nerdy on that stuff. So like 20 years later, is, do you find that it's, is it limiting to have a duo set up? Not uh, at all. No, no, I think, uh, no, I think for us, I mean, it's always been that the less is more approach or the kind of the restriction that breeds creativity, creative solutions to those restrictions and to those kind of, uh, you know, you have four corners, uh, uh, you know, of a, of a piece of art and everything that is art has to fit in those corners, you know, and it does, the scale can change and the composition of what fits in there can change, but you're always going to have those four corners. And so I think there's restrictions on almost everything, but I think for us having these two people has always has made us very resourceful and, um, you know, we implement a lot of, um, samples and, and loops and, and textural elements. And I think this last record, we kind of went a little wider with that where I, I painted myself in a corner. Sometimes we spent the last two weeks, um, preparing a lot of these new songs for, to take out on the road and not since, um, our, our record and object was it, did, was it such a heavy lifting to kind of translate these things? Like I said, the last record was designed to go on the road where this one was just designed to sound to, in the, in the studio. So it's been kind of interesting that the one that we made live, we didn't get to tour with the one that we made for ourselves in the studio is the one that we're gonna have to go on our, on this next tour yeah i'm psyched to see you guys i really am curious what happened between 2013 and 2018 yeah so dean and i both got married both had kids dean's father passed away mm. but we also did i think six or seven tours also in those times oh you did okay yeah so we were we it was never a complete we we released a self uh released um seven inch we also switched from from sub pop to touch and go and mm-hmm. I, so I think there was a little bit of life. I think we needed to take a breath because we really, we kind of came into existence around 2006. 
And really from 2007 to 2013, there was not really much time spent at home. We kind of found ourselves fairly spent as, as individuals, you know, kind of, it's hard to maintain friendships, let alone a relationship or family. You guys were just newly friends, right? Well, no, we met in 2000. Yeah. So we did wives kind of from 2000 to 2005. So tell me about the refinement of, cause I've never heard wives. Is it basically, can you hear a lot of no age in it or is Oh, it right. You asked that kind of earlier. Yeah. No, I think the wives probably had a little bit more of a touch of a Jesus lizard, maybe there. The way wives worked is I would write songs with the drummer and Dean would write songs with the drummer. Hmm. And so I would play on a Dean song or he would play on a Randy song, but there was never really a Dean Randy collaboration in that band for whatever reason. It was just the nature of how we were writing and our age and our skill set at that time. So uh, the drummer uh, left the band or we, we kicked him out and, uh, and we got a new drummer and we found ourselves on tour in Europe, kind of grueling, grinding it out. And we, and you know, I kind of looked at Dean. I was like, we could just break up. We don't have to keep doing this. Mm-hmm. And it was sort of the like, you know, calling out the elephant in the room. And he was like, oh yeah, it sounds nice. I was like, yeah, let's just finish this run of shows, and then we'll just this band can be over. And that just made the rest of the the tour so much nicer to know, like, hey, we're just going out and having fun. This is just for fun because we don't have to do this anymore after this. Because the guy and not having the guy in the band was like, why are we even playing? It just felt performative, like miming something, right? right. You know. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. And then as, as that was going on, it was like, well, what if we, what if you and I wrote songs together? You know, like, what would that sound like? I don't know. I don't know. It was such a novel idea that sounds so silly. I think to people that aren't in a band, if you've ever been in a band, you know, that's, it's all about the politics of who's writing what, whose side are you on and what song are we going to do and who, who outvotes the other one, you know, that kind of stuff. Are you guys super different? Cause I kind of get the vibe that he's much more of the insular, like, uh, you know, he, he doesn't really do interviews, right? Yeah. I don't, he doesn't enjoy them. And I have fun talking to people. Yeah. yeah I think we are, we are pretty different people, you know, but we're close enough over all these years that we're, you know, we're like brothers, but I'll still, after all these years, 20 years, you know, over 20 years of, of knowing the guy, I'll, he'll give me a look sometimes. I'm just like, do you even like me? Like, <laughs> are, with, like and, he'll, and he was like, that's just my resting face. Like, I'm like, oh, okay. It seems like you just smelled shit or you're like in pain yeah, to be yeah, around it's me. It's funny the shit that we bring to the table. I mean, I feel that way about my wife every day. And then I got to remind myself, <laughs> there's no reason she would stay married to me if she really hated me as much as I was thinking she did. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we share that same conception. But then there's time and then I'm overly sensitive. He'll say one thing about a song or a part that I played and I'll just be ready to burn the whole house down. Right. Like, oh, you hate the song. You hate everything. You hate the way I play music. It's a dumb song. Okay. Okay. It's like, dude, calm the fuck down. I'm just saying that the way you arrange that one solo part in this thing doesn't sound great. And I've just got, I got to calm myself down. But I think I, you know, it's as it is, you know, I think, I think some of the conflict makes for an interesting um, creative output. You know, I think we do, we do feed on each other. And I think we inspire or antagonize each other to the point where interesting art hopefully gets made have you guys do you think you've achieved what you set out to do i mean you must have had some kind of uh you know even if it's if it wasn't conscious some kind of uh, aesthetic itinerary and you guys have been around for a while you guys change but you change by degrees so obviously you're not gonna you're not building towards your new metal record or a yacht rock (laughs) thing you found your sound so did you achieve it um, I, I think from, you know, from a younger perspective, like when we, we set out, I think the goals were surprisingly achievable. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I don't think we were setting too high of a goal. It was about, you know, yeah. I think some of the goals were, some were spoken, some were unspoken, but there was a degree of what's behind that velvet rope. You know, there was some of that kind of exploration of like, what are those fancy people doing over there? And so we got into some fancy places and realized there wasn't much going on behind the curtain, you know, the, the, <laughs> but it was kind of the Wizard of Oz scenario, like, oh, that looked a lot cooler than we thought it would playing on these big festivals or doing meeting right. these celebrities. That's not all, that's not necessarily f- a fulfilling goal in it, in and of itself to know about that world. So there was some of that, which, you know, past. And there's also just songs in creative goals of like, you know, we're wanting to make pop songs out of really harsh and um, uh, gnarly sounding noise elements. Like what's the sweetest song we could write with the ugliest sounds, yeah. you know, some, some juxtapositions of things like that. And I think we, we've, you know, we, we hit those marks on some, on some records. And I think as we've gone, the, the target changes, the, tar- the target keeps moving. Right. I think ultimately there's a self, um, a self that, you know, to know thyself better, to express thyself better, you know, that there's a, there's a, an ability to try to be honest. I think as, as, as our career goes on or as our 
as this creative project goes longer, like what is it to be honest for where we are today? And I think, you know, it's like, it's that kind of thing, like I said, you know, almost like the singer songwriter sort of vibe, the, the disarmingness of like a Bob Dylan, where it's, you know, just putting out your, your truth as you see it today. And I think that's, that's a challenge that will kind of always be moving, you know, cause you're always changing and what, and not, and, and avoiding, avo- trying to avoid cliches and, and platitudes. So when you first got sober, did the writing of your fourth step, assuming you, you work the steps, uh, did, you know, that kind of coming face to face with yourself in front of a mirror that's covered in shit and just systematically removing the feces, did that help you start writing in a different way? Uh, it's interesting. I never really put the two on the same page. I think for myself, but obviously, you know, for myself as a person, I think I was able to understand and see myself anew again. And then mm-hmm. I built, I built something called self-respect, which was not mm-hmm. something that was in my vocabulary, right. but unbeknownst to me, mm-hmm. it wasn't as though I, you know, I had this conscious ability to, to know that or see that. I think it was something that was, was you know, revealed to me I'm like, oh, okay, well, I wouldn't do certain things because I don't want to lose respect for myself. I've never had that feel. There's something preventing me here. What is this? What is this, uh, this, this invisible wall preventing me from, you know, taking actions. And it's like, Oh, okay. That's called respect. I see. I see. So the moments like that, I think were, are, are, uh, revelatory, you know, from, yeah. as from a personal standpoint and then songwriting creatively, I think it was just the ability to be bored. I think that was the biggest thing I found in, in new sobriety it was just, I found myself bored. I had never, I was never able to be bored in, in active, Hmm. addiction because i Hmm. i didn't have the time i was was, you know half the day i was useless or more than half the day i couldn't be counted on to do anything so i had to get all of the work or you know pay the bills do the band practice do all the stuff in this very finite window before i was i was lost in a cloud of of substance right you know so it was like i was very busy all the time i'm very busy i got no i don't have enough time for myself when really that's all i had so you know find the sobriety of that kind of like moment of like oh what am I going to do? I'm going to take a walk. I'm going to draw a picture. Right, I'm going right. to write a song. I'm going to do this. You know, kind of, I found this new sort of pink cloud, you know, it changes. It's not, it's not all roses. And yeah. No, details. it's also not the answer. It's not like you get, you get sober and then, and then, uh, it, you know, it clicks and everything's great from that point forward. It's certainly not like that. You know, it gives you tools, right. In order to deal with the hard yeah. stuff. And hopefully you can show up and you can be honest. And, and when you're not, you can correct yourself swiftly. Yeah. And, tr- and try to f- try to th- try to eliminate the amount of time of of fucking up and saying you're sorry right that's, right. that's, right. that's kind of the, the the continual challenge for most sober people I'm, yeah i'm sorry until the next time you mean well hopefully yeah yeah but at least but at least you're but at least recognizing your transgression right like right. not right. not defending it or, or 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 living in that i i'm right so go fuck yourself but I've also uh, exited the point of my life where I feel like just because I have addictive uh, traits, that it's that it's has to be my fault. Forgiveness, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know. If, yeah, right. I, I went through a big a big moment of just understanding forgiveness, not as in and not or acceptance, but not as accepting the negative actions of others or this kind of thing, but just accepting them as points of uh, fact. Being mm-hmm. able to release myself of the burden of hate or animosity or resentment, right? All those those yeah. fun words. You know, I, I could no longer resent these people because it was, it was doing me more damage than the, even their initial transgression had done. You got to forgive them and release them so that you can release yourself instead of how, re- how replaying long trauma. Work in the program. Just had twelve years. This Good for you, man. Yeah. yeah, plenty of plenty of rocks and, and stones to yeah, trip yeah. over. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I don't, I don't say so that. Hard. I don't say that from a place of yeah, any, you know, like you, like you said, you know, with, with, with uh, all you have is the one day, right? Every every day is, yeah. is a challenge and a blessing, and then tomorrow is someone else's. I'll tell you one thing that I that I was perfect at. I I may have, you know, a, a, a lot of it is unfortunately extenuating circumstances with my medical stuff. Sure. But no matter what was happening with me, I called my sponsor every day. And when wow. I say every day, I really <laughs> I mean you every did. day. Yeah. yeah. Um, cause I felt like a panic that if I let one day go by where I didn't reach out, that would domino itself to the point where there was no way back. Hmm. What's your worst album? Ooh, what can, what can't you listen to? That's a good. That's or a good or is there is there any? No, you know what? I think I think uh, there's parts of an object that that bring me pain because Dean and I were not getting along for all of that. 
so it's hard that you know, what's happening in there that's the only record i i don't not like an object yeah. i would just i would just call it uninviting yeah yeah i think it was by design i think dean uh we'd had actually had a whole other record recorded prior to that one and he uh exercised his right to scrap it and mm -hmm. want to start something new which i was taken aback by and and so we we started in earnest on this new endeavor that eventually became an object but i think dean was was that was doing battle with something that I was not part of, you know, uh -huh. in terms of whatever his, he was working on through that record and challenging himself. And I just, it, it felt like we were, I just was along for the ride in some regards of just trying to br bring his vision to fruition. You know, I was kind of playing a, a, a participatory role in that thing rather than guiding it and constructing it. I think he needed to have some type of control for whatever reason over that record. And that was the result. And, and it was just difficult to make and difficult to play and difficult. And at the point where I felt very, again, this was, you know, I'm, I was, you know, about two years sober, three mm -hmm. years sober when that record came out. And I was just feeling the, the glow of a new page. And I, whereas I think his last page in terms of what his challenges were, were just, he was a, hanging on by a thread and I was mm -hmm. walking around whistling and newly in love, getting married, hoping to start a family, a new page. And I get to do it all while traveling the world with this beautiful rock band I have unbeknownst to me my partner is is you know mentally in anguish and spiritually kind of bankrupt and of his own sort of volition and had, having his own issues with life and how he's he was dealing with life whereas I think I was so like you have to be you know in sobriety and those kind of things I was very inwardly facing and taking yeah. care of myself and I think uh his his road was he needed to do that for himself so that's kind of where that break from 13 to 15, uh, 13 to 18 comes in and yeah, switching yeah. labels and all that sort of stuff. So I think that's, there was a tough moment there. And I think honestly, we could have broken up and called it a day after that record, but, um, I was half you know, expecting it to, to happen, to be honest with you. That's but, what Sub Pop said. Yeah. When we told him we wanted to make a new record for snares, you know, cause I gave him the kind of the, the obligatory, or I thought what I thought was obligatory, like, Hey, you know, even though we're out of contract, we're talking about making a new record. Isn't this great? We're back together. You know, we're, not that we're back together, but we never really split up, but it's a, we're, right. we're actively we're going to work on the, a new musical outing. And, uh, the guy or in our person there was like, Oh, I thought you were going to call me and told me you broke up. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, no, we're actually going to make another record. And he's like, oh, well, I'll have to talk to legal about that if there's anything to do. And he just never called us back. So <laughs> that was clear. Well, the writing was on the wall. We were out of contract. They didn't want to hear from us. And we were sort of like, okay, well, that sounds fine. But we were very happy. Um, you know, I think Dean was was very happy about that and wanted to go to Drag City because, um, and again, they're fuck, they're amazing. They're they're not this, they're not second runner up prize at all. I feel like it was right. the right place for but us. Did, as but we, did you we feel like that sort of Jesus Lizard Capital Records sort of a pressure when you were with Sub Pop? I think there was a there was a type of pressure, and again, we were young and not really understanding the parameters of everything about it. You know what I mean? It's hard to mm -hmm. it's hard to know. I mean, we weren't we weren't babies. We were you know in our the latter part of our twenties, but still, you know, our heads were not necessarily on on focus and it swiveled on tightly where we could understand what that is all about. But the sub pop thing was 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 they were they were supportive and excited, and then it kind of then turned to like, oh, you guys. And I think there was a lot of changeover in their ranks in terms of the people that work there. Like we had a different publicist for each record, and mm -hmm. not that that's anybody's fault. I think the records did amazing. I think they did a, they did us a huge service of kind of popping us up onto a bigger stage, a world stage that mm -hmm. we would not normally be on. And they, and we were a very well promoted band. You know, like we were a a, a, a product that no expense was spared in promoting us <laughs> from a record standpoint from from live people standpoint like the uh, the the amount of of goodwill that we had was it was immeasurable and um and i think it, it was great you know it definitely launched us out into a stratosphere that I, neither one of us had ever really considered happening but you know but then you look at the mechanics of it you know and it's like we get 15 percent royalties on records you know and right. it's not not uncommon at least at the you know at the time nobody told us that was a horrible deal and it's not necessarily the worst deal people get but you know once we finally recouped i like did the math i'm like oh wait we made back all the money but at 15 percent. so that means they made 85 percent of that money <laughs> oh okay right. i get how that works you know right. and so you know the mechanics of that kind of stuff and i think it's hard to not you know just feel a little sting of the like of the growing old like cool yeah they helped us out a lot and we 
did what we did for them. And, and, you know, I don't have any bad blood about it. I think Jonathan Poman was always very sweet and very nice and had a very like soft touch as an owner of a, of a major record label. But it sounds like drag city is more simpatico to the kind of totally. career. Well. I think so. Yeah, no, I think, you know, the idea was, you know, as Dean and I kind of reformed and got our heads back in the same space to do um, snares. It was, it was this thought of like, we want to, we're going to get old. That's and, and, as we do that, why not get weirder? I think our, we found our tastes to be more unusual. Mm-hmm. We wanted to experiment more and just try different things. And so we kind of had this thought like, you know, where are the old weird people at? And Drag City was a harbor for some of those types mm-hmm. of people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where it can be yeah. unusual and it doesn't, you don't have to be um, the flavor of the week. I think there's some of that at Sub Pop. Obviously, you know, they want to sell a lot of records and th- you, you do that by signing young bands who could be popular for you know brief periods of time you guys have a very dependable integrity you guys have been around for a long time everyone expects that whatever you release uh is going to be a, a, at the very least a, just a solid offering but it almost always is way beyond that and Thanks. uh i'm psyched to see where you guys uh go because you know except for the you know the the uh-oh period of an object you know everything seems to have been relatively smooth sailing for you guys thanks yeah i think hopefully we you know onwards and upwards and we keep we'll keep doing more cool stuff and it'll get weird and it'll take different different roads and i you know i'm curious i'm curious to see what the road at road ahead of us is i'll be a fucking flag waving fan till the oh, end seriously thanks, really thanks david i appreciate it All right, that just about does it. A heartfelt discography thanks goes out to our graphic designer, Todd Zimmer, my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason, Randy Randall, the folks over at Drag City, the Vintage Annals Archive podcast, which you seriously have to check out pronto, my incredibly loyal fans, and especially the entire Patreon community, the Soldiers of Sound. I love every last one of you, and this show would not exist without you. But wait just a minute. This is just the entrance to the rabbit hole. No need to stop now, because we're on a roll. Join us as we descend down, down, down on Discography's week-long spoken word deep dive. Another way to dive even deeper is to get thee directly to either Jesus Lizard episode, wherein Randy rates the entirety of their catalog. That's episode 70 and 71, not to mention episode 64, 65, 67, and 68, wherein the streak of brutal pummeling music continues with the hysterically funny Jim Florentine rating the Black Sabbath catalog. Of course, if you're subscribing to our Patreon, then you already know to keep your ears peeled throughout the week, because this Monday continues the spoken word deep dive with our very special Patreon-only early release wildcard episode, Anthony Fantano, The Interview, wherein we learn which punk band had an enormous kind of influence on him as a teen, what kind of music he was listening to while growing up in suburban Connecticut, and how he struggled to get his show off the ground during his lean years while simultaneously flipping pizzas. Not to mention Wednesday's incredible Patreon-only episode of Discography's The Private Press with Paul Major, wherein we'll be covering Bob Larson Speaks Out on Rock Music, the anti-rock music preacher with a propensity for explaining to the kids how horrifying rock music really is by shredding on endlessly sick rock guitar. That's patreon.com slash discography. And be sure to mark your calendars, because next Friday, April 21st, we're coming at you with part one of our very special David Pajo interview. Seminal Pajo, firsts, favorites, and flavorings, in which, yes, we learn plenty about Slint, even though there's a separate upcoming episode on just them. But we also learn plenty about his favorite albums of all time, his pre-Slint outfits, and the many, many bands that incorporated David into the fold, yearning for that special Pajo flavoring. And so, from now till then, don't let our youth go to waste, lads and ladies. It's Discography. Graffiti.